In this video, I'm going to teach you about spasticity, spasms of a limb, cramps, or limbs that are just hard to bend. Don't turn away because that starts right now. Hey! Howdy! Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I'm the founder of the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis, where we care for people impacted by MS from around the globe. We accept all major insurance carriers, and we're currently actively enrolling for clinical trials. In today's video, we'll be tackling spasticity. What is spasticity? Spasticity is a problem where opposing muscle groups fight. Let me give you an example. If I want to bring my arm up here, my bicep has to shorten. That muscle has to get shorter to pull my arm forward. But the tricep muscle has to relax. It has to let go. Now, I don't tell my tricep to relax. My brain and spinal cord do that for me. And if I have had damage to the brain and spinal cord from multiple sclerosis or from a stroke or from some other process, what happens is really, really weird. I want to do this, but my tricep didn't get the memo. And so my tricep also wants to do that at the same time. And so now I've got a bicep that's pulling in, I've got a tricep that's pulling out, and I've got a tug of war across my arm. That's spasticity. How does a patient experience spasticity? Spasticity presents itself in three different ways. The first is a spasm or a bouncing of a limb. The second is a cramp, which is a visible muscle contraction like a charley horse. It can be super painful. The third is a limb that's hard to bend. For example, a difficult time bending your knee to get in and out of the car. What causes spasticity? Any condition or disease that damages the descending motor pathways in the brain and the spinal cord can cause spasticity. It's very commonly seen in the setting of MS. In fact, upwards of 70% of people with MS may experience a degree of spasticity. And it's believed that 35, 40% of those people have severe spasticity. It's also very common in other central nervous system conditions like stroke, cerebral palsy, traumatic brain injury, but basically, any condition that damages the brain or spinal cord can result in spasticity. So when a disease like MS injures the brain and spinal cord and causes spasticity, what happens chemically? What happens to the neurotransmitters? Oh, what a very nice question. When you need your tricep to relax, your brain and spinal cord give off a neurotransmitter called GABA. GABA is the stop neurotransmitter. And so when GABA binds to the back of the spinal cord, that's what allows the tricep to turn off. And when there's been damage to those descending motor pathways of brain and spinal cord, you're not producing adequate GABA where you need it to give the tricep the signal. How big of a deal is spasticity? Is it really a big problem? Spasticity severity ranges from being minimally annoying to being, in some cases, the worst thing going on. There are some people that only have spasticity in the winter, and it may only cause their leg to feel a little bit stiff. There are other people that have stiffness which impacts the way they walk and frequent cramps and spasms. There are other people that have such severe spasticity that their legs or arms are essentially encased in a cast and can't move. There are some people where the spasticity is so severe they're in constant pain their limbs are stuck in an awkward, bended position, and they actually have decubitus ulcers and skin breakdown. My point here is, is spasticity, the symptom, like any symptom in MS, is a range or a spectrum. And our goal here isn't to remove the spasticity, but to make you functional as possible and to make you not in discomfort or pain. What makes spasticity worse? Spasticity is always worse under two conditions when it's cold outside. Now I live in sunny Columbus, Ohio, and I joke when I say sunny because for a good portion of the year, there isn't really any sun out there and it's really cold. And as the weather gets colder and colder, I get more and more phone calls from my clinic patients saying, Aaron, I'm getting really stiff. When it gets colder outside, spasticity kicks up quite a bit. And in a place like Ohio where we have warm and cold seasons, we really see, see that. The second situation where we can see spasticity getting worse is when your body is still. So for example, if you're sleeping in bed and not moving, you're going to wake up and be stiff 
or if you're riding in a car for a long period of time or sitting at your computer working for a long period of time, you may notice when you get up that it's really hard to bend your legs. There are other situations where spasticity gets worse and they all surround a noxious stimulus, like if you have a urinary tract infection or you're impacted and need to move your bowels or if you've recently had a tooth infection, or if you have an ingrown toenail, all of these things can create an uptick in the degree or severity of spasticity. What are some ways to treat spasticity without using medicines? There are actually a lot of ways of addressing spasticity without taking medicines. First off, stretching is super, super helpful. I oftentimes recommend that folks stretch when they wake up in the morning, even before they leave their bedroom. You want to spend at least 30 seconds in each position so that your muscle learns what you're trying to accomplish. And I would stretch out my hips, my butt, my back, hamstrings, calves, quadriceps. Spend a good amount of time. Just 5-10 minutes is going to really change the first half of your day. I also recommend that you stretch when you enter into your bedroom before you go to bed. And this is going to help reduce spasms and cramps while you're sleeping. Then you simply want to stretch once in the middle of the day. So before you leave your bedroom in the morning, once sometime in the middle of the day, and then before you go to bed. Another helpful tool is other forms of exercise. So going on a daily walk or a daily swim, participating in daily yoga or some other exercise class will really decrease your degree of spasticity. Movement is really, really important. And what you may find is that you can only sit still for a certain amount of time before your legs start to tighten up or cramp. And so if you can figure out how long that is, you can game out your day to make sure that you go for a walk, get up from your computer and stretch before that happens. All of these things can be really helpful. Now, other things to think about are things like making sure that you're adequately hydrated and making sure that you're not constipated or impacted with stool, making sure that you don't have uh, dental cavities or ingrown toenails. These actually can make a difference you'll find that if you have those things, your spasticity will kick up. And so by attending to them, you're gonna find that it can bring it back down. As far as medicines for spasticity go, when would you inject Botox and when would you take a baclofen pill? That is another really good question. The answer lies in where is the spasticity on the body? If you only have spasticity in your hand, you're not gonna to wanna to use a baclofen pill that's dissolved and spread out throughout your entire body. You would rather do something focal for focal spasticity. And you can use Botox injections to pop open the hand and treat focal spasticity. Botox can be very effective when there's a small area involving spasticity. You can't Botox both arms and both legs. There's just too many muscles and that's too much Botox. But if you need to Botox the foot or around the knee or around the bicep, those can be very excellent uses of focal toxin. The medicine baclofen is a synthetic pill of GABA. So when you ingest baclofen or when you receive baclofen through a pump, you're giving GABA, the stop neurotransmitter, back to the spinal cord. Baclofen, the pill, you swallow and it's dissolved throughout your whole body. And it's a more appropriate treatment when you have more than just a focal area of spasticity. So for example, when you have both legs or all four limbs affected, then you're not gonna Botox, you're gonna go for a systemic therapy. And I always start with oral baclofen. There are many other oral antispasmodics and another one that I use, particularly in the evenings at bedtime to treat spasms and cramps is Xanaflex or Tizanidine. Now, both baclofen and tizanidine can be very, very sedating. Tizanidine more than baclofen. And so we have to be cautious about using them and about slowly titrating up the dose so that people don't feel like they're a zombie. How often do you take pills of baclofen? A pill of baclofen is gonna last about five hours. And so working with your provider, you can dial in the baclofen dosing specific for you. Some people only take it before bed because they only have spasms at night. Some people only take it before physical activity because that's when they find it helps them the most. Some people have to schedule it four times a day. The flexibility of oral baclofen is quite helpful. So when would you consider a baclofen pump instead of taking baclofen pills? When you swallow a pill of baclofen, very little actually gets to your spinal cord. And so sometimes you need very, very high doses so you can get just enough to the spinal cord to have an effect. 
And those high doses can cause side effects like sedation and confusion and dizziness. Unfortunately, there are situations where someone's spasticity is so severe that the oral dose of baclofen they would need would also make them sleep all day long. And so obviously that doesn't work. I consider a baclofen pump in a patient if they have four things going on. Number one, they're spastic. Number two, they don't like it. Number three, what we're currently doing isn't working, meaning the physical therapy, the Botox, the stretching, the splinting, the baclofen, the Xanaflex isn't pulling it off. And lastly, they're reliable. So I'm gonna trust them if we're gonna consider a baclofen pump test dose. In someone who is spastic that doesn't like it and it's not working out and they're reliable, I will offer them an ITB test dose to find out if that might be another option. Now I will tackle intrathecal baclofen pumps in a separate video. And if you'd like to hear more about spasticity, just click the video that's on your screen right now. My name's Aaron Boster and thank you for learning about MS with me until my next video or my next live stream or the next time I see you at the Boster Center for MS, be safe and take care.